It's Friday night in October of 1993. And in Northern California, three junior high school girls are having a slumber party. Halloween is around the corner, and the girls have been trying on different costumes in preparation for the upcoming holiday. Within seconds, their lives will change forever. October 1st, Polly Class and Jillian Pelham were waiting for another friend outside of Polly's house in Petaluma, California. It was around 8.30 when Kate McLean and her mother showed up. The three girls were ready for fun. It was Friday night. There was ice cream in the fridge, and they were going to stay up all night long. This was going to be a party. No one had any idea of the danger that lurked so close by. The girls kept to Polly's bedroom, but they couldn't suppress the noise as easily. At about 9.45, Polly's mother, Eve Nickel, looked in on the girls and asked them to keep it down. She was suffering a migraine headache and thought she'd turn in early. Eve's bedroom was right across the hall from the girls, and although she had chided them about the noise, she was pretty sure it would only take a few minutes for the 12-year-olds to get noisy again. Before going to bed, Eve took her prescription pills to block out all distractions and get her fast to sleep. The party continued on for almost an hour before the nightmare began. It was around 10.30 when the intruder entered the room. At first, Kate and Jillian thought it was a joke. Then they saw the knife. He told them if they screamed, he'd slit their throats. Immediately, he tied them up and started asking questions. He wanted to know which girl lived there and who else was in the house. Polly spoke up. The girls were terrified and crying. And he assured them that he wasn't going to hurt anyone, that he was only there for money. But when Polly told him where some cash was hidden in a jewelry box, he made no attempt to find it. He gagged the girls and took the cases off some pillows to use as hoods. He made Polly get up and told the others to count to a thousand. By the time they were done, he said she'd be back. Then he took Polly class and disappeared into the night. Petaluma police officers were called to the scene after the girls managed to free themselves and wake Polly's mother. They responded in minutes. Investigators entered Polly's room and began to look around. The bedroom was in disarray and told of the events that had happened just minutes before. 
On the floor were binding materials, cut strips of cloth. The cords from the Nintendo game had been cut, and a strap that was clipped from a purse lay on the floor. Pillowcases were strewn about. I know. What Petaluma police detective Mike Meese saw wasn't encouraging. So I remember standing at the doorway to Polly's room and looking at these few bags of evidence that we had been able to collect and thinking that that was just such a pitiful amount. And I looked down at the rug and I talked to, to my partner, Larry Pelton, and said, let's take the rug. And he said, why? And I said, I don't know why, but let's just take the rug. We just don't have enough evidence. FBI. Police were in desperate need of assistance. Fortunately, help was on the way. After being contacted by the class family, the Federal Bureau of Investigation offered its expertise. How about, uh, have you all talked to the mother? Yes. Uh, Shortly after midnight, the FBI appeared at the house of Polly Class. Typically, the Bureau handles kidnappings, and with 800 a year to investigate, they have plenty of experience. Because he was familiar with the community and experienced in kidnapping cases, Special Agent Ed Fryer became the lead investigator. But he knew something about this case was different. It uh, had all the earmarks of a stranger abduction case because the statements from the two girls were consistent. Stranger abduction cases are the, are, are the hardest cases to solve, in my experience, because, again, there's no connection between the perpetrator of the crime and your victim or the victim's family, or somebody even associated to the, to the victim. It's a, a, a random act. Surprisingly, a vast majority of kidnappings involved disgruntled family members. And though Polly's parents were separated, her father, Mark Class, was immediately cleared of any responsibility. Abductions involving total strangers are exceedingly rare and leave little for investigators to go on. In this case, however, there were witnesses. Was his hair long or short? A police sketch artist was called in from the San Rafael Police Department. For two hours, Jillian and Kate tried to recall the face of the man who had barged into the bedroom. The girls were still terribly upset, but they managed to give the artist a pretty good description. Authorities now had their first idea of what the stranger looked like. Nose and mouth. Uh, After 4 a.m., the girls were taken to the police station, like this. and the FBI called in one of its special forces, the evidence response team. Tony Maxwell leads the crew. In looking at cases across the United States, we have found that when somebody is kidnapped, especially a young child, that they will generally be harmed within the first 24 hours, and probably within the first couple of days could even be killed. So time is of the essence. In that kind of work, the investigator needs to move quickly. The evidence response team is designed to provide forensic resources at a major crime scene. Their sole responsibility is to collect evidence. And they use the most sophisticated collecting equipment available to do it. An electrostatic dust print machine collects tiny hairs and fibers off the floor when a positive charge is passed over a sheet of mylar. Any loose debris clings to the mylar and is sent to a lab for careful inspection. Although the police department had already dusted for fingerprints, they had come up with nothing particularly promising but they didn't have access to the same equipment as the FBI. The alternate light source was a new method that employed a unique fluorescent powder, which when combined with a distinct ultraviolet light and amber-colored goggles, could illuminate many things that otherwise would remain hidden. The team found four dozen fingerprints the police were unable to see using conventional equipment. But even those were of no use. 
they were attributed to family and friends. After hours of meticulous searching, something finally turned up. A palm print that at the outset seemed like the first real piece of forensic evidence left behind at the scene. That palm print was found on the bed, on a crossbar of a, um, uh, of a bed, where he apparently put his hand up for just a second to lean on it, perhaps to support himself as he was grabbing something. And with the alternate light source and the fluorescent fingerprint work that we did, we were able to see it, collect it, and then gather that for the laboratory. At that time, the FBI's fingerprint database, APHIS, didn't contain palm prints, only fingerprints. But even a palm print won't catch a suspect. It will only identify one once he's captured. FBI Special Agent Mark Mershon explains. People often uh, think that when you have a fingerprint or a palm print that you quickly uh, you know, quickly uh, establish the identity of a criminal. The truth of the matter is, in, in most instances, you have to identify a suspect, have fingerprints for that suspect in order to compare with a latent fingerprint. The hunt for the suspect prompted authorities to cover Polly's neighborhood inch by inch. By dawn, more than 100 agents and officers had begun a 24-hour search for Polly and her abductor. Helicopters and bloodhounds had been called out, and an all-points bulletin was issued by local authorities and the FBI. Systematically, the authorities searched every house in the neighborhood. Agents went to Polly's school to talk with teachers and students in the hopes that somebody might have some useful information. Investigators canvassed the neighborhood in pairs, asking if anyone had seen anything suspicious that night. One by one, they interviewed all of Polly's neighbors. Several people recalled seeing a stranger around the neighborhood that fit the description given by the girls. Thomas Georges and his friends were on their way to the video store at around nine o'clock that night when he noticed a stranger standing in the shadows in front of Polly's house. Thomas knew everyone in his neighborhood, but he had never seen this man before. Returning home a few minutes later, the boys saw that the stranger was still there. The description Thomas gave to the authorities matched the suspect they were looking for. Sean Bush was playing video games with some friends who lived in a small rental cottage directly behind Polly's house. It was about 10.30 when Sean happened to glance out the window. He was surprised to see a strange man on the back porch of Polly's house. He appeared to be going for the back door. His description of the man also fit that of the suspect. There were others who saw the suspicious man that night but unfortunately, none of them alerted the authorities. As Petaluma Police Chief Patrick Parks explains, time was working against them. In stranger abduction cases of small children, there is no more critical factor than time. Time is absolutely of the essence. And for that reason, you have to get out as many resources as you can. You have to put out the word as far as white and white as you can. You have to involve as many agencies you, as you can, get them focused, get their efforts channeled, and hopefully, hopefully, bring about a successful resolution. While officers continued to comb the neighborhood, FBI investigators began executing the standard operating procedure in cases like these. 
After eliminating family and friends as suspects, they focused on ex-cons who were registered as sexual offenders throughout Sonoma County. Gradually, they branched out to surrounding counties, carefully questioning and investigating each registrant. But nothing turned up. This is a hard case to believe that it even happened. There are three girls that are, that are in a slumber party. They're playing games in their bedroom, in their home, in a typical community, in a typical city. And somebody can walk into your home, the sanctity of the home, the security of your home, and take your daughter is, is uh, if it wasn't impossible, was it inconceivable. The following day, the search for Polly Class had escalated into the largest manhunt in the nation. A massive community volunteer network was formed to assist authorities. While hundreds of citizens searched, others passed out flyers, trying to cover the entire city as quickly as possible. Back at the FBI's Trace Evidence Lab in Washington, D.C., forensic expert Chris Allen was carefully surveying the items collected from Polly's house. I noticed that in untying the pieces of bindings, the, the uh, thin nylon strips of bindings that were used to tie up Polly's girlfriends, that they had jagged edges to them. And I was able to line them up perfectly so that I was able to determine that these all came from one piece of cloth originally, and it was a piece of cloth like a, a lady's nightgown or a, a slip material. Other pieces of evidence found in Polly's room were not so easy to classify. Tiny fibers collected with the electrostatic dust print machine proved to be a challenge to identify. After painstaking examination and comparison, Allen concluded that they had come from the interior carpet of an automobile. Eliminating the cars that could be accounted for at Polly's house, Allen suspected that these carpet fibers were most likely from the kidnapper's car. One more item Allen found was a little more personal to the suspect. I found in the vacuuming of the area rug that was in Polly's bedroom that she was playing on with her girlfriends, uh, a dark brown, forcibly removed head hair. And I say forcibly removed because it had a three or four millimeter uh, root sheath on it, actually skin material that comes out of the scalp when the hair is forcibly pulled or yanked out. If Polly had pulled a hair out of the suspect's head, it was evident that she didn't go without a struggle. But even a hair with DNA evidence couldn't bring investigators any closer to finding a suspect. The palm print lifted from the bedpost was sent to Michael J. Smith, a fingerprint specialist with the FBI. Examining the print under laser light, Smith determined that the print had enough ridge detail to photograph. But the light emitted from the laser turned the print orange, and Smith needed to capture a black print on a white background. He instructed the photographer to reverse the color so that the finished print would appear the way it would on a fingerprint card. Now the print was indelible and could be filed until a suspect was apprehended. Investigators had unearthed some solid evidence, but it wasn't enough. Time was running out, and Polly Class was still out there, somewhere. Forty-eight hours after the abduction of Polly Class, her father, Mark, Hello. got a call. Polly? It sounded like Polly. Okay, honey. She told her father that she was in a hotel room somewhere, you? and that her abductor had stepped out for a moment. Tell me where you are. Polly! Then Polly. the line went dead. It offered the first glimmer of hope. But unfortunately, since Mark's line wasn't set up for a trace, a fryer, all please. authorities could do was wait for another call. Word of the abduction spread rapidly. 
In two days, 50,000 flyers had been distributed. Community volunteers quickly organized a search command center to work in tandem with the police and FBI. It was an unprecedented grassroots effort. A telephone bank was manned 24 hours a day to field calls and tips. A copy of every lead that was phoned in was shared with the FBI and Petaluma police. Before long, the search center had screened 60,000 calls. Out of those, authorities were compelled to follow up on over 12,000 leads. Processing that amount of data would have been virtually impossible without help from an FBI computer processor. The FBI just happened to have the rapid start team. It was a relatively new concept with the FBI where on a high, uh, an investigation with a high volume of information, we would computerize that information, uh, essentially triage the, uh, the value of the investigative leads and make the assignments and track the, uh, uh, the progress. Even with so many leads, there was one in particular that investigators were anxious to follow up on. When Mark Klass received the first call, the FBI was powerless to do anything about it. The second time she called, they were ready. Hello. Like the previous call, it sounded like Polly, well, how are you, and she could only talk for a short time before she had to hang up. Where are you? But it was long enough for authorities to make a trace. Polly. The FBI had traced the call to a house 30 miles away. There hadn't been enough time to collect an army of agents. The job would have to be handled by a few. Something wasn't right. This was just a normal family home. There was no sign of Polly or her abductor. A terrible realization dawned on the agents. When they sat down with one of the girls in the house, she confessed to making the calls. She admitted that friends from school had dared her to call and impersonate Polly. The entire incident had been a cruel joke. This was the, the only indication we had after a week's time that uh, Polly just might be uh, alive still, and we all were poised and hopeful that this would yield a solution and her safe recovery. Of course, it didn't. In mid-October, Kate and Jillian were brought in to give another description of the man who tied them up. A highly acclaimed forensic artist was flown in to make a second sketch. It was pretty well cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The artist was known for relaxing witnesses enough to coax an accurate description from them. The girls were less stressed than they had been that night and were able to give her more to work with. No, they were, they the were second better. sketch was much more precise. This sketch looked like a person. New flyers were distributed immediately. There was no time to waste. But if you look back at true stranger abductions, we have this rule of thirds. The children who are abducted, typically one third are recovered alive, one third are recovered dead, and one third are simply never heard from ever again. That's what we faced in this particular investigation. And that, uh, I think, was one of our uh, motivations uh, to keep the sustained effort up. After a reward had been offered for Polly's return, authorities received a call demanding a $10,000 ransom. 
They traced the call to a Petaluma apartment building. This time, a SWAT team showed up in force. They were not going to take any chances. FBI, FBI! Once again, authorities and the family had been fooled. Twenty-year-old James Hurd was arrested for attempted extortion and posing as a kidnapper. It was a crushing blow for everyone. Uh, it became very frustrating. It was certainly distracting towards the main thrust of the investigation, but you had to deal with it. There was no way around it. You could not ignore those things. And it, it certainly chewed up a lot of time and resource. The family had been especially discouraged. A letter Polly's parents wrote to the kidnapper was published in the October 17th San Francisco Examiner. Whoever you are, wherever you are, please return Polly to her family. She belongs here. We miss Polly so much. We miss the twinkle in her eye and her sweet humor. We long to see her beautiful smile and hear her musical voice. They also addressed Polly. Our darling, if you can read this, please know that your mommy and daddy love you so much, and we will continue to search for you until we can hold you safely in our loving arms again. I don't think I ever lost hope. So I had numerous contacts with Mark Class, with Eve, with members of the family, and that was a question posed to me many times. And my response was, no, we have not lost hope. We will not lose hope. Across the country, people wanted to see Polly brought home. Banners sprang up. And Americans began a candlelight vigil. Thousands donned ribbons of lavender, Polly's favorite color, to show their support of the search. We conducted searches uh, during the day, during the night. We had a 24-hour operation going. Uh, we conducted searches uh, sunny days, on foggy days, rainy days, uh, rainy nights. Whenever the information came in, we reacted to that uh, because in a case like this, physical evidence is crucial. The search never stopped. The Navy and search and rescue experts joined the thousands of volunteers who were constantly looking. Police and volunteer task forces worked tirelessly. But it would be nearly two months before anything broke. November 28, 1993. It was two months after Polly Class was kidnapped that authorities got their first real lead. In Sonoma County, a sheriff's deputy was called out to the house of Dana Jaffe. It sat at the end of a long, winding drive off Pythian Road. Dana had been out inspecting her property when she noticed something unusual and thought it might be of use to investigators. She led the deputy through a densely wooded area to a clearing just a few yards from the long winding drive to her house. Scattered in the woods were a few items that seemed somewhat suspicious. There was a large piece of silk cloth that had been fashioned into what appeared to be a hood. A couple of strips of packing tape were on the ground. A pair of young girls' tights had been tied into a knot, and human hair was entangled in the knot. Other debris surrounded the area. Then Dana recalled the night she'd caught a trespasser on her property not far from where they stood. It was nearly two months before. It all started when Dana's babysitter, Shannon Lynch, had left Dana's house and was making her way back down the long driveway. A man was walking down the middle of the private drive. His stranded pinto was off to the side. Get out of the car and help me. And, and 
He said that he was stuck and insisted that she get out of her car and help. He also wanted to know what was up the drive. But Shannon immediately sensed something wasn't right. She'd later describe him as looking like a wild man. She drove on, leaving him there, determined to get to a phone. Shannon found a payphone about two miles down the road and hurried to call her friend. She was anxious to get a hold of Dana and warn her of the scary man trespassing on her land. Dana didn't waste any time. She grabbed her daughter and a baseball bat and took off down the hill. She saw the car, like Shannon had said, but the strange man was nowhere in sight. She continued down into town and called the police. A few minutes after midnight, two Sonoma County Sheriff's deputies showed up. Dana explained that she didn't really want the intruder arrested for trespassing. She just wanted him off her property. The deputies found the trespasser a little agitated. There was alcohol on his breath, and he was sweating profusely. There were bits of leaves and brush in his hair, as if he'd been rolling around on the ground. He told them that he'd been out sightseeing when he realized that he was on private property. When he tried to turn around, he got his car stuck on the side of the drive. He blurted out that he'd been under the car trying to free it, but the deputies didn't believe it. The way his car was trapped, there wasn't enough room for a person to get underneath. The deputies administered some roadside sobriety tests, but he passed them all. Looking in his car, they found some cans of beer in a plastic bag and a small duffel bag in the back seat. When they asked him if he'd been drinking, he actually opened a beer and began to drink it. They immediately made him pour it out and then told him they wanted to pat him down. He became extremely upset. Leave me alone, just keep that stuff away from me, all right? To make him comply, the deputies told him they would be within their rights to run him in on trespassing. After he'd heard this, he calmed down considerably. They searched him carefully and continued questioning him, but could find nothing incriminating. He was just odd. The deputies remained suspicious, but when they ran his license, it checked out. His driving record was clean, and he had passed the sobriety tests. They had held him for about 45 minutes already, and they had no legal means to detain him any further. There was nothing left to do but pull his car out and send him on his way. That had been two months ago, the same night that Polly Class had been abducted. A hood, bindings, a young girl's pair of tights. It was too much of a coincidence. Putting it all together, the deputy quickly put a call in to the Petaluma Police Department. Within an hour, Detective Mike Meese and Agent Ed Fryer arrived to check it out. I'll never forget the scene. It was uh, late at night then. Uh, by this time, Mike Meese and I are, are standing up on the hillside there on Pythian on the road. It was beginning to get a little misty and foggy, and the rain started to come down. And uh, we looked at each other, and we knew. We knew in our hearts that we had basically uncovered a very critical crime scene, that this was going to lead us to the res resolution of this case. After the evidence was collected, investigators immediately began searching the Pythian Road site for any signs of Polly. We spent days searching the mountain with over 300 volunteers, I believe we had 25 to 30 search dogs, and uh, we conducted extensive ground uh, searches for Polly, uh, believing that she was still alive. 
which was the premise that we were working on. As the search commenced, everything began to snowball. Authorities checked with the Sonoma County Police to get the full report of the incident that happened on Dana Jaffe's property. The man deputies had questioned was Richard Allen Davis. Accessing his criminal record revealed he had recently been paroled from an eight-year sentence for kidnapping. What we learned about Davis initially was uh, 1976, he had been arrested for uh, robbery and kidnapping and uh, assault with intent to commit rape. We learned in uh, 1978 he had been arrested uh, for another kidnapping, as well as a couple of counts of assault with a deadly weapon. 1984 he had been arrested for a kidnapping case, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, including the use of a firearm and armed robbery. You start reading these reports and realize, you know, hey, this guy's a bad actor. This is, a, this is an individual certainly more than capable of being involved in a crime like this. The arrest photo on file matched the girl's description. His mother lived in Petaluma, giving him reason to have been there. The pieces were falling into place. The items discovered near Pythian Road were immediately flown to forensic specialist Chris Allen in Washington. Of the most interest was a strip of cloth that was found in the woods. Allen was quickly able to confirm what detectives had suspected. Essentially what we're do trying to do is establish whether or not the cut edges would line up or match. The middle strips uh, represent the fabric that was found at Polly's bedroom, which were used to bind uh, Polly's girlfriends. <clears throat> Subsequently, on the second submission, we received the cloth that was found at the Pythian Road site. These all fit together like a puzzle uh, with the uh, edges and the, and the pieces of fabric matching up end to end. The strips meant more than likely Polly Class had been out at Dana Jaffe's after her abduction. Without a doubt, Richard Allen Davis had been there too. Though it wasn't enough to arrest Davis for kidnapping, detectives felt if they could just get him in custody, they could quickly gather the evidence they needed to tie him to Polly's disappearance. Everything else fell away, and we focused on what we had with Mr. Davis, what happened out there at Pythian Road, and what we were going to do next. When investigators discovered Davis had an outstanding warrant for breaking parole and DUI, they decided to bring him in. But he wasn't at home when they arrived. Then a deputy sheriff who was securing a perimeter around the area stopped a van. At the wheel was Richard Allen Davis. When the deputy realized who he had, he calmly called it in to the investigators back at the house. Is there a problem, officer? No, sir. Just sit tight, okay? Authorities reported to the scene, and Detective Meese approached the van and asked Davis to step out. Step out of the van. He informed him that he was under arrest for violation of his parole. No. I'm Detective Meese. I'm arresting you. For One thing I think is important to understand how Richard Allen Davis around. was taken in custody, because it was such a low key event, and because Mike Meese uh, went ahead and handcuffed him, he did it in a very professional way, and he started a rapport going with Richard Allen Davis that later was very useful uh, in bringing resolution to the case. It had been two months since Kate and Jillian had seen the man who took Polly class, but they had no trouble picking him out of a lineup. Number one, step forward, please. Even without the beard, his was a face they could never forget. Number one, step back, please. Though he'd been arrested for parole violation, Davis was questioned about the kidnapping. He vehemently denied any involvement, but authorities let Davis know that if he wanted to talk, the door was open. 
So I took Davis into the hallway and I told him, I said, hey, look, what you need to know is, is we've got all the physical evidence it takes to make this case. And all you're looking at is a kidnapping right now. So if you want to talk about it, you got to let me know. And uh, he made a noncommittal response, didn't want to talk. And I remember patting my pockets looking for a business card. Didn't have a business card with me. And I said, you know, I'm going to leave my name and number with those guys, meaning the correctional deputies. And if you ever want to talk about it, you know, give me a call. Back at the FBI latent fingerprint lab, Mike Smith was comparing the palm print found in Polly's bedroom with one that had been taken from Davis since his arrest. This was a crucial piece of evidence. Matching the two prints would undoubtedly link Davis to the abduction. After careful examination, the results were called in to Agent Fryer. I, I just got a call from FBI laboratory. They matched Davis's palm print to a palm print taken off of Polly's bedroom uh, or her bed post. Um, it was again one of those moments where I, there was butterflies in my stomach. I again realized that this was really very powerful evidence. So I hung up the phone and again there was a lot of noise and commotion in the command post. I stood up and I asked everybody, can I have your attention please? Can I have quiet for a moment? I said, <clears throat> we just got confirmation from our laboratory that we've matched this palm print uh, taken from the bedroom to Davis. We can place him in the bedroom. And it was just a huge cheer from everybody. Papers were flying. Uh, it was just great news to everybody. This is it. It's concrete. He was in her bedroom. We can prove it. We had him nailed down. Though news of the matching print had gone public, Davis was being held in isolation and had not heard anything about it. Then one day, a friend of his showed up for a visit. He urged Davis to talk to authorities and tell them where Polly was. But Davis continued to deny responsibility. Then his friend gave him the news the rest of the nation had already heard. It came as a complete surprise. Davis realized it was going to be impossible to explain how his palm print got in Polly's bedroom. There was only one thing he could do. In Davis's mind, he's now got to do something, and that is try to make whatever deal he can make with the authorities because we, we know that, it, that he was in Polly's bedroom. We can put him there. While on his way to the massive search for Polly near Pythian Road, Detective Meese was paged to call the jail. This was the moment everyone had been waiting for, and Meese was anxious about what he might find out. Yeah. After this wait, you know, Davis comes on the phone, and I recognize the voice, and so I know it's him. And I said, uh, he says to me, he says, "Hey, I, I screwed up. I, sc I screwed up big time." Detective Meese and Special Agent Larry Taylor met with Davis in the interrogation room, where Davis related the details of the night of October first. Though he was living in something like a halfway house, he had applied for an overnight pass to go visit his mother in Petaluma. Unable to find her house, he had a few beards and walked the streets of Polly's neighborhood. At one point, he was stopped by a man who wanted to sell him some marijuana. He decided to go ahead and buy the joint. In Davis's own words, he got really buzzed and went to the store for more beer. He soon found himself wandering the neighborhood aimlessly. He wasn't sure where he was or what he was doing. But Davis had come to the neighborhood prepared. He brought a bag packed with bindings and tape. Forensic experts were able to determine that he had cut the strips with a pair of scissors, a fact which implies intent. Then Davis said he randomly picked a house on the street and crawled into an open window. 
He remembered hearing TV voices and said he may have picked up a knife in the kitchen. He said he didn't remember anything after that. He claimed the next thing he knew he was driving in his car and was surprised to find a young girl sitting next to him. She was complaining that her hands were tingling. According to Davis, he adjusted the straps for her and drove around wondering what he had done and what he should do next. Then he drove off the side of the road and got the car stuck. Once he realized he was stuck for good, he says he got Polly out of the car and carried her up a steep embankment about 30 yards away. Get out of the car! He planned to leave her in the darkness until he could figure out a way to free the car. The rest of Davis's story about what happened at Pythian Road matched the witnesses' accounts. At the time of the incident, the bulletin about Polly's abduction was just going out over police radios. But the deputies were tuned to a different frequency and would not have heard it even if they had been in their cars. They ran his license, but the equipment they had at that time was only able to give a cursory printout of Davis' driving record. It couldn't generate his criminal record. They found nothing they could okay, hold sir. him on. What I want you to do is, all right, I'm follow my finger. Davis recalled how the deputies pulled his car out and escorted him to the main highway. But he claims that he waited for 15 or 30 minutes and returned to the site to find Polly. Then he just drove around. At some point, he realized he had to get rid of her. At long last, authorities had found out what they'd been desperate to know. Polly Klass was dead. And Richard Allen Davis was the man responsible. Davis agreed to take them to the site in a deserted area of Cloverdale where he had left the body. It was night, but inspectors felt the need to confirm Davis's story couldn't wait until daybreak. He led them to a field near an abandoned lumber mill. Out in the field, under some boards, investigators found the body of Polly Klass. It was, uh, it was an odd feeling. Uh, you're in the presence of somebody like Davis and just a few yards away is, is what's left of a very beautiful, innocent 12-year-old. The Polly class case was special because people cared. Because the whole community stepped forward and said, this is the last child you're going to take. And that this is our child and that we are going to go out and look for her until we find her. The case wouldn't come to trial until 1996. But after 10 weeks in the courtroom, a jury found Davis guilty on 10 counts, including kidnapping, robbery, burglary, murder, and attempting to commit a lewd act on a child. The latter charge Davis continued to deny during the entire trial. Investigators strongly believed that despite Davis's testimony, Polly was already dead at the time deputies helped him with his car. He was sentenced to death and continues to sit on death row at San Quentin Prison. Polly Class left behind a legacy to save other lives. The way missing persons cases are handled has changed forever since the investigation. Law enforcement databases are linked to different agencies providing vital information to multiple jurisdictions. 
Missing persons bulletins are now sent out over all police channels. At routine pullovers and traffic stops, officers can access not only driving histories, but criminal records as well. Implementation of the three strikes you're out legislation was a direct result of the case, as was the push to expedite the appeals process in murder cases. And a foundation established in Polly's name aids the search for missing children. involvement of the FBI uh, was critical to bringing resolution to this case. Had they not come in and gotten involved early on, uh, it's doubtful we would ever have had resolution or certainly that it would have been as, as quickly as it was, even though it seemed like a long time. The unique partnership that was formed between local police and the FBI set a precedent that continues to this day. In 1982, a California Highway Patrol officer pulled a young woman over for speeding. He bullied her into sex and then killed her. He then used a decade of police experience to try to cover up his crime and convince local investigators of his innocence. But would he get away with it? Society depends on trust and authority. It's a system that works, and because it works, we hardly think about it. A uniformed officer demands respect, and we willingly comply. But what if that trust were betrayed? What if a police officer abuses his authority? George Gwaltney was one such cop. The popular and decorated California Highway Patrol officer committed the ultimate violation. He murdered. I'm Jim Kalstrom former director of the FBI's New York office. When good cops go bad, the full power of law enforcement rallies to repair the damage, rebuild the trust, and deliver justice. The Gwaltney case taxed the resources of both state police and the FBI. He was a cunning adversary, trained in crime solving, and he knew how to cover his tracks. 23-year-old Robin Bishop had left her home in Las Vegas to visit a friend in Los Angeles. But then you gotta carry trays, so you gotta work on your own. Robin had <laughs> hopes of becoming an actress. Her friend convinced her that if she was serious about acting, she had to move to L.A. Okay, let's see. Robin headed back to Vegas to pack up and make the move. She was excited about her future. In Barstow, California, she stopped to call her mother and get a sandwich. Returning to her car, she fell under the gaze of a predator, California Highway Patrolman George Waltney. Though he was a highly respected officer and member of the community, Waltney had a secret history of stopping women for speeding and then soliciting them for sex in exchange for getting out of a ticket. The night of January 11, 1982, was no different. He quickly memorized the make and model of her car. He also noticed the Nevada license plate. Next, Gwaltney saw a neighborhood boy he knew, a boy who, if necessary, could be used as a convenient alibi. Hey, Preston, you want a ride? Sure. He picked up Preston Olson and gave him a ride home. A former winner of the Officer of the Year Award, Gwaltney was well known for such kind actions. Barstow parents trusted Gwaltney to keep a protective eye on their children. He dropped Preston off at his house and said hello to his parents. By now, the young woman whom Gwaltney had targeted would be well out of town, headed toward Nevada on Interstate 15. 
The ordinarily well-traveled highway was unusually quiet. He caught up with her on the empty highway east of Barstow. He turned on his light and siren and pulled her over. Robin Bishop had a string of tickets for speeding. She had in fact just finished a year of probation and had been given a warning that another ticket would cost her her license. Robin knew that a car and a driver's license would be essential for an aspiring actress in Los Angeles. how fast you're going. Pretty bad. It's a little bit too fast. I'm gonna have to ask for your license, man. Alright. Okay, Robin, I'm gonna have to ask you to get out of the vehicle and uh, follow me back to my blood. She left the okay, keys in the Robin. ignition and her purse in the car. Robin was probably surprised to be taken back to the patrol car, but she obeyed. Unfortunately, Waltney had more than a speeding ticket in mind. Uh, go ahead and turn around for a chance on your head. I'm going to have to pepper the ticket. For speeding? Yep, that's, that's the law. I was just speeding. Waltney stood her up against the patrol car and handcuffed her. Seat. She must have been scared and confused. Why the handcuffs? Where was he taking her? Waltney returned to her car to get her purse. At that moment, a car with a lone driver passed by. Waltney retrieved the purse, returned to his car, and pulled away, leaving her car abandoned on the interstate shoulder. He drove Robin to an exit that led to a seldom used access road running parallel to the highway. It was a place he often went to take a break during his patrol shift a secluded lookout point where he could observe the highway some 400 feet away, clearly, from all directions. There, holding the threat of jail or loss of license over her, Gwaltney raped Robin Bishop. When he was done with her, he radioed in a wants and warrants check on Robin's car as if it were abandoned. He knew he'd been spotted walking towards Robin's empty car. Yeah, I'd like to uh, report a 2829. Yeah, license number 561 FBD. It was the first in a long line of lies covering his actions for the official record. Copy that. after and was simply going to let her go. But as she sat on the ground to put on her boots, something happened. Perhaps anger replaced fear now that she was released. Perhaps she threatened him with exposure. Her brother was a prosecutor in Nevada. Regardless, it would be her word against his. But then, as he stood next to his vehicle, he was suddenly caught in the spotlight of a passing deputy sheriff's car. The deputy may well have noticed Waltney's patrol car from the highway nearby. Waltney could not know whether he had been recognized. 
Suddenly, Robin's threats became more real. How could he explain being out there on the access road? In a moment of panic, Officer George Gwaltney decided Robin had to be silenced. Gwaltney took a final and irrevocable step. Now, there was no way to distance himself from the dead girl. Frantic, he devised a way out. He called the dispatcher and reported finding a dead body, a possible suicide. Knowing he had only moments before other officers would arrive at the scene, he searched under her head for the bullet that had killed her. As evidence, the bullet had the power to destroy him, but there was no exit wound. Homicide detective Milt Rose of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department was sent to investigate the dead body found by Gwaltney. On his way to the crime scene, the dispatcher asked that he examine the abandoned car. As the body had been found a short distance away on the access road and was visible to investigators already at the crime scene, the police suspected there was a connection between the car and the body. I did not see any obvious signs of any malfunctions. No mechanical breakdowns. The tires were all in good condition. Uh, the vehicle was uh, in gear. The keys were inside the vehicle. Why did the vehicle stop at the location it was at? At the crime scene, Officer Gwaltney was now composed and professional. He described how he found the victim, checked for a pulse, and looked in her purse for identification. The Nevada vehicle registration and driver's license identified her as Robin Bishop, owner of the abandoned car he had called in earlier. Although Officer Gwaltney had reported an apparent suicide, Detective Rose quickly ruled out that possibility. The victim had been shot in the back of the head at close range, then moved slightly. Four inches from her head was a stream of blood on the ground. Clearly, this was a homicide. Recent rainfall made tracks and footprints from Gwaltney and his cruiser clearly visible in the damp sand. In this general area, we found a couple of footprints that came around, appeared to come around the front of the vehicle. They travel around in the front of the vehicle and off in a direction sorted towards the middle area of the vehicle. We travel over here into an area about where this bush is located or right in this general area. And that's where Robin Bishop's body was found. The other footprints that we found were leading from the driver's door on the highway patrol unit to an area towards the front of the vehicle and then over towards Robin's body, kind of facing off in the easterly direction. The first officer arriving on the scene criticized Gwaltney for the profusion of his footprints, a clear contamination of the crime scene and uncharacteristically yeah, sloppy work. Why are you going to do this? You need to come to the For their examination, I noticed what appeared to be marks on her wrist. The marks were familiar to any police officer. Two thin marks across the top of her wrist and one across the bottom, typical of those made by handcuffs. Then, when Detective Rose examined the contents of the victim's purse, he could find no signs of robbery, but the vehicle registration and driver's license were lying on top of the purse's contents, as if they'd been shown to someone and quickly thrown back into the purse. It indicated to me that we needed to take a look at some type of vehicle stop or somebody in some type of position of authority possibly stop this car. To Rose, the evidence pointed to the involvement of a police officer or someone posing as one. Every investigator at the crime scene was either a friend or a colleague of Officer Gwaltney. That he might be connected with the crime was not even considered at this point. An autopsy was performed. The results confirmed that the body had been moved slightly after being shot and that the bruises were in fact made by handcuffs. The fatal bullet was found lodged in Robin's jaw. Though it was the caliber of a standard police service revolver, the brand was not the standard ammunition. 
The autopsy also showed that she had had sex within 24 hours of her death, but there were none of the normal physical signs of a forcible rape. The first thing we needed to do was to eliminate people that had been to the scene or could have been in the area. Uh, other highway patrol officers, other deputies, whoever was in that particular area around that time frame. We needed to start with uh, Officer Gwaltney to begin with because Officer Gwaltney was a person who found the body. Gwaltney's survival depended on staying one step ahead of the investigation. When he finished his shift that night, he struggled to remove the gun barrel from the murder weapon. It was the one piece of hard evidence that could conclusively implicate him in the crime. Gwaltney knew his gun barrel left identifiable markings on the bullet that killed Robin Bishop. The next morning, he went to a local gun shop to order a new barrel, which would confuse a ballistics test. But the barrel was not in stock and had to be ordered. Then he took his uniform to the dry cleaner and his holster to the repair shop for re-dyeing and re-stitching. All that remained was to stall for time until the gun barrel arrived. In Barstow, Rose held a briefing that morning with the police and sheriff departments to discuss the case. He asked all officers on duty the night before to turn in their weapons so that ballistics tests could eliminate them as possible suspects in the crime. Gwaltney made sure to attend. During the briefing, he learned that the fatal bullet had been recovered. By early evening, Gwaltney was the only officer who had not turned in his weapon for testing. The detectives went to his home and asked for his service revolver. He returned moments later with the wrong gun, his off-duty weapon. George, this isn't your service revolver, and that's what we need. Oh, the captain sent him back for his service revolver, but he returned empty-handed. You aren't going to believe this, but it, uh, it's been stolen. What do you mean stolen? Stolen. Well, George, there's been some burglaries in the neighborhood. He claimed that his house must have been burglarized. The gun was missing. Have to ask for the story sounded doubtful, but because Gwaltney was a highway patrol officer, Detective Brian English with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department was inclined to believe him. I kind of empathized with him because we were, in my opinion, we were looking for evidence to show that he didn't do it. It was some criminal that did it. You know. Gwaltney agreed to come to headquarters for questioning. But first, the detective searched his locker for the missing weapon. They found nothing. Then we sat down and we started talking with Officer Gwaltney. And to him, it didn't appear important that his gun was gone, which was very significant. And if, if I was in his position, I'd been extremely worried, and it didn't seem to bother him. By now, it was almost two days after the crime. The missing weapon and Gwaltney's odd behavior made it impossible to deny the obvious. Gwaltney was advised of his constitutional rights. Although this made him the primary suspect in the case, there was insufficient evidence to actually arrest him. Insisting he was innocent, Gwaltney agreed to give a tape-recorded interview. that we can record on tape about the night that Robin was shot. Yeah, I have no problem with that. He said he'd worked his regular beat patrolling the interstate on January 11th. After his dinner break, he had picked up a young boy he knew, Preston Olson, whom he had seen walking home alone. After dropping Preston off at his house, he was by 8.50 p.m. back on the interstate. About 9.15, he found the abandoned car, ran a stolen vehicle check, then turned onto the access road. Seeing a pale shape he had pulled over, it was the body of the victim, Robin Bishop. He was not reacting normally for a person who had been accused of committing this kind of a crime. Had it been me, I would not be talking to them. I'd tell them to prove it. I'd be very irate. I'd be very upset. Officer Gwaltney had repeatedly insisted on taking a lie detector test. He reiterated his statement and then answered a series of critical questions, including the direct question, had he killed Robin Bishop? No. The examiner could find no sign of deception in the polygraph exam. 
Gwaltney had just crossed another hurdle in his cover-up. We transported George from the Barstow station back down to San Bernardino for, for the questioning. At that time, uh, George gave his consent to go ahead and search his house. Sheriff's deputies investigated Gwaltney's claim that his house must have been burglarized, but they could find no sign of forced entry. The homicide detectives then began their work. At dawn, they found the frame of a Smith & Wesson Model 19 357 Magnum revolver inside Gwaltney's truck. The frame was badly damaged with tool marks. It appeared to have been dismantled by someone who had no knowledge of how to take it apart. The barrel, which would have been used for a ballistics comparison, was gone. Therefore, there's no ballistics match could be done. The gun frame was registered to George Michael Gwaltney. To the detectives, it had been dismantled for only one purpose. Gwaltney was placed under arrest. But the evidence was still only circumstantial. A link between the revolver and the tools used to dismantle it had to be found. The detectives returned to Gwaltney's home for another search. Evidence was collected. Gripping type tools and a pipe vise found behind the garage that showed fresh signs of metal transfer. In the bedroom closet, detectives found five boxes of bullets bearing the CHP insignia. In the boxes among the standard police rounds, they found 27 bullets of another brand, 357 caliber 158 grain soft points made by Remington Arms, the same kind of bullet that killed Robin Bishop. Gwaltney's wife was in a state of shock and disbelief. When questioned, she assured the detectives again and again that George had not been acting strangely or in any way different lately. He was a good husband and a good father to their children. He's a wonderful husband and a very caring father. News of Gwaltney's arrest stunned the small community of Barstow. His fellow officers had known and respected him for decades. Despite the considerable evidence against Gwaltney, they were unable to accept his possible guilt. Pretty dramatic and emotional uh, thing when uh, another law enforcement officer uh, is accused of committing a murder. Most of the people knew George, and they could not believe that George Gwaltney could have done something so bad. I recall a couple of the officers that were close friends of his were in tears when I was interviewing them because they didn't want to believe that George could do this. Even the investigators struggled to come to grips with the conclusion they had been forced to draw. I would, my feeling was, he didn't do it. He couldn't do it. He's a highway patrolman. But the evidence continued to mount. Semen was found in the backseat of Gwaltney's cruiser and in Robin's jeans. A critical report was filed by Sheriff's Deputy Roger Kaufman, who had been out of town the days following the crime and had only just learned of Gwaltney's arrest. He described driving by the exact crime scene area about the time of the murder. From the interstate, he spotted a car's parking lights on the little-used access road. Shining his spotlight on the car, he saw an officer standing by it, but was driving too fast to identify him. Barely minutes later, he heard a very upset Gwaltney calling in a possible suicide on the radio. He'd been surprised to hear Gwaltney, a man known for his unshakable presence, sounding so agitated, but had not given the incident any thought until he learned of the arrest. As the investigation progressed, it became apparent that Gwaltney had used his knowledge of investigative procedure to thwart detectives' efforts to collect evidence against him. His uniform had been dry cleaned, his holster re-dyed and re-stitched, allegedly for an upcoming inspection. Any evidence of blood or tissue transferred from the gun had been destroyed. His footprints had altered the crime scene. When detectives questioned the owners of gun stores in the area, 
On the theory Gwaltney would have tried to buy a replacement barrel for his service revolver, none could recall him being in their stores. After several months of an internal investigation, Gwaltney was fired from the California Highway Patrol. Okay, bye. Now convinced that he had committed the worst imaginable crime, detectives were still unable to prove Gwaltney was lying. His wife and friends still solidly supported him. Nine months later, the trial began, with prosecutor Betty Kennedy confident that the considerable evidence, though mostly circumstantial, was strong enough to result in a quick conviction. In his opening statement, defense attorney George Porter told the jury that George Michael Gwaltney was the victim of a frame-up, possibly by someone in his own department. Someone stopped Miss Bishop, as he would show, but it was not George Gwaltney. The defense produced a key witness, railroad worker Dennis Goobler, who testified that he had passed Robin Bishop's empty car on the highway shoulder that night. A light-colored car was parked 50 feet behind it. Goobler described to the jury a man carrying a flashlight who was approaching Bishop's car. His description, however, seemed to eliminate Gwaltney as the man he saw. Other suspects, Porter contended, must be considered. The prosecution constructed a precise and elaborate timeline for the jury, from Robin's final phone call to her mother in Barstow to Gwaltney's radio call reporting the discovery of her body. The timeline included all of Gwaltney's known actions and time for the murder as well. The prosecution believed its case was bulletproof. Travel times, the pickup of the Olsen boy, the deputy sighting, the radio calls, everything. But Gwaltney's attorney countered by producing dozens of witnesses, CHP colleagues and personal friends who testified to his impeccable character and record. He used the timeline itself to cast doubt on the series of events. Could Gwaltney possibly have had enough time, barely 20 minutes, to do all he was accused of? The defense easily challenged the scientific analysis of the semen samples from the car and the victim. The technology for using DNA in the courtroom was still six years in the future. In addition, Porter was able to cast doubt on the prosecution's inconclusive tool mark analysis of the gun frame and tools taken from Gwaltney's vehicle and residence. Nevertheless, the prosecution believed the bullet evidence and the dismantled gun frame would be enough to convince the jury. The strongest uh, evidence that we had in the particular case was the frame of the gun. How can you explain the frame? How can you explain why it was in the vehicle? Why was it taken apart? Why was the barrel missing? Why was the cylinder missing, the grips, the hammer, the trigger? Why? It's mere Gwaltney was prepared and polished, providing the defense with its best witness, himself. He had an answer for everything that was question to him. And every answer he had was feasible. And what their defense tactic was, was to put a small amount of doubt into each one of the items of evidence that we presented. And that's what they did. And George did an excellent job of tying up all the loose ends when he testified. In the end, the testimony of 50 witnesses in 30 areas of expertise and all the accumulated evidence failed to convince the local jury. After four days, a deadlock was declared, 8-4 in favor of acquittal. George Gwaltney was a free man. Nothing is, as some people say, a slam dunk. And uh, you never know which way the jury's going to go. You never know which, which evidence the judge is going to let in and which ev evidence the judge won't let in. So, Because I wasn't involved in the daily routine, I was very much surprised that George was not found guilty. We spoke to a number of the jurors, and a few of the jurors thought there was a good possibility George was the one responsible, but they couldn't believe he actually did it. And if he did do it, he was a highway patrolman, he worked hard, he worked for the community, uh, he was respected. We just couldn't find him guilty. 
Still believing George Gwaltney was guilty, prosecutors were determined to get a conviction. Less than one year after the mistrial, Gwaltney was tried again in Superior Court. But with little new evidence presented, the trial ended in another deadlock jury, 7-5, in favor of acquittal. George Gwaltney walked away, seemingly out of reach of the law. I was stunned. I sat around for several hours just thinking about rehashing. What could have we done to change the outcome? What could we do if and when there's another trial? Therefore, Arguing the appearance of harassment, the judge trial. denied prosecutors a third trial. It appeared that George Gwaltney could not be brought to justice in the town of Barstow. We felt, and I was convinced, that George killed this lady and that we needed someone to come in and prosecute George. George needed to pay for what happened. From the moment of Gwaltney's arrest, the FBI had been watching this case with great interest. Anytime a homicide involving a police officer takes place, the FBI monitors the investigation. After Gwaltney was acquitted a second time, there was enormous public pressure to find the truth surrounding Robin Bishop's murder. The FBI's Los Angeles field office decided it was time to intervene. The FBI knew that George Gwaltney could never be tried again for Robin Bishop's murder in the state of California. But in a federal court, he could be charged with violating her civil rights. By killing Robin Bishop while he was on duty, George Gwaltney had committed a federal crime. By taking her life, he had violated her civil rights. This had never been argued in a criminal trial before. But the FBI and federal prosecutors believed the Bishop murder was a perfect test case. The case was assigned to Special Agent Michael Randolph. Gwaltney was like a wolf in the sheep pen. The local law enforcement didn't know that he was the perpetrator. He was the person that had committed the murder, so he would stay one step ahead of them, destroying evidence. And this is a significant reason that the locals were unsuccessful in their prosecution. They didn't realize what they were dealing with. Exhaustively reviewing the crime scene photographs, Agent Randolph's attention was caught by a photo. It revealed the contents of the trunk of Gwaltney's patrol car the night of the murder. In it, he spotted a small box of ammunition he sent the photos off for enlargement and analysis. We were notified by the FBI laboratory that photographic analysis uh, revealed that that was a box of 357 Magnum am ammunition and was, in fact, illegal ammo of the type that Gwaltney had testified he did not carry and was not carrying the night of the murder. It was also, we believe, the same box of ammo that was collected from his house. Agent Randolph had just caught George Gwaltney in his first lie. We knew that he had lied about one thing at the two local trials. There had to be other things that he had lied about. Working closely with the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department and the California Highway Patrol, Agent Randolph began re-examining virtually all of the evidence from the first two state trials. Instead of handling it as a usual criminal investigation, we, we took an exhaustive approach, sort of like a TWA uh, Flight 800 approach. Every rivet had to be looked at, every rock had to be looked at. The mountain of reports, transcripts, photos, and physical evidence would be painstakingly re-examined by the FBI labs and bureau field agents. Key things that were used that we sent back to the lab would include such things as obviously the frame of the gun. The frame of the gun had been recovered by the local police and they had done tool mark analysis but had been unable to show who took the gun apart. The gun frame was sent back to the firearms tool mark unit of the FBI labs in Washington. Unique in the world, the lab has a collection of over 2,000 guns, from John Dillinger's pistol to the newest military assault rifle. Every bullet manufactured for the last 50 years is here too. Hollow point and steel jacket, 22 to 50 caliber. Like the guns, they're all here for testing and comparison. 
The soundproof ballistic room allows for comparison firing and bullet retrieval. Comparative microscopes allow for precise analysis of the gun barrels. But the most valuable asset in the lab are the agents, whose long experience in these specialized tests make them invaluable in difficult cases such as the Bishop murder. Jim Cadigan of the FBI Firearms and Toolmark Unit was brought into the case to conduct a toolmark analysis of the gun frame and the 15 different wrenches and tools, including the pipe vise, taken from Gordney's home. Steel tools almost always leave behind some distinctive and often microscopic mark after their use, a signature as unique as a fingerprint. The FBI Toolmark Lab is one of the largest, most specialized, and most technologically sophisticated in the country. It was obvious from the beginning that the individual that had worked on this particular firearm knew something about forensics because he had removed several pieces of the uh, firearm that could be of some use later on to a forensic examiner. Agent Cadigan approached the very specific task of associating the tool marks on the gun frame with the tool marks made by the 15 gripping tools taken from the Gwaltney home. The question was, could one of these tools have been used to hold the frame while the barrel of the firearm was being removed? In looking at the frame, I noticed near where the, um, the hole was for the pin that locks the barrel down, very near the hole for that, there was a small uh, 16th of an inch impression, almost uh, as if it was made by a small screwdriver tip, right below that hole. This tiny mark matched a small imperfection in one of Gwaltney's tools. In looking at the tools that were submitted from Gwaltney, I noticed that one of those tools, a pipe wrench, had a broken tooth and the tooth was broken off on, in the middle, and then there was a small island of metal uh, left on the tooth. And that looked very similar to the mark that was on the frame. So using that as a pivot point, I started making impressions with that tool and comparing those impressions uh, under a microscope, the tool marks, with the uh, impressions that were on the frame and was able to come to a conclusion that that particular tool was used to the exclusion of any other tool to make the marks that were found on the frame. In addition to the tool marks testing, the FBI lab conducted extensive testing on the particular bullets found in the Gwaltney home. The lack of a barrel on Gwaltney's gun made a ballistics test impossible, a problem that had hurt the prosecution in the state trials. So the FBI lab devised a test that had never before been used forensically, a radical new use of nuclear technology in forensic science. When a manufacturer of lead like Remington Arms makes a batch of lead, they throw things in much as you would when you're making meatloaf. That makes each batch of lead unique. We then took over 200 rounds that the locals had collected when they did their investigation of George Michael Gwaltney. We submitted those to the lab the lab made those radioactive and got their molecular weight, their chemical fingerprint, and lo and behold, we find approximately 27 rounds that are the exact match as the lead taken from the head of our victim. The samples in the reactor absorb neutrons and become radioactive. This radioactivity is measured and gives a precise reading of the chemical elements in the lead from the bullet, an atomic fingerprint. The radioactive tests were indisputable. Each of the 27 bullets found in Gwaltney's closet, bullets he had sworn under oath he did not own, had come from the same batch of lead as the bullet that killed Robin Bishop. The FBI lab worked to establish a definite match between Gwaltney's gun frame and his pipe wrench and between the fatal bullet and the bullets found in his home. Additionally, Agent Randolph constructed psychological portraits of not only George Gwaltney, but Robin Bishop. It was important that the federal jury perceive her as a genuine victim. Robin Bishop was raped by someone she was taught to respect and trust, an officer of the law. This made it very easy to understand 
the lack of force of violence that was evident in the crime scene other than the, the trauma. And uh, she was compliant. She respected law enforcement authority. She's the type of person that pulled over and opened her wallet and handed her and stood out and was handcuffed even though she knew all she had done was a speeding ticket. It made her an easy victim. In the same way, the FBI examined every aspect of Gwaltney's background to gain an understanding of his behavior around women. By questioning a woman who admitted to having an affair with Gwaltney, it was learned that she would meet him at his regular spot along the isolated highway for sex. The same exit to the access road where he had taken Robin Bishop. Every woman who received a summons from Gwaltney in the last two years was contacted and a pattern emerged. Nearly a dozen women claimed that Gwaltney had solicited them for sex or touched them suggestively. This indicated to us that this was not an isolated sexual assault with Mr. Gwaltney. This is a type of pattern of behavior. When he put his uniform on, he became predatory towards females, was, was our conclusion. Witness testimony from the state trials was also carefully re-examined for discrepancies that could lead to breaks in the case. In some instances, the FBI leaned hard with the weight of federal authority. Many witnesses were reluctant to testify, fearful. It's a small community, everybody knows everybody. We had to let them know that a federal investigation is just not a local matter that's going to blow away with the wind out in the desert. We're going to be here until this is resolved. This persistence led to one of the most crucial breakthroughs in the case. San Bernardino Sheriff's detectives had originally interviewed the owners of Barstow gun shops for signs that Gwaltney might have tried to buy a replacement barrel for his service revolver the day after the crime. None claimed to have seen him. One of those interviewed was a Mr. William Addington, owner of the Powderhorn Gun Shop. He had denied during both state trial investigations that George Gwaltney had been in his shop the day after the murder. But printouts from the shop's phone bills caught Addington in a lie. And we found toll records that show the day after the homicide, late in the afternoon, after the briefing that Gwaltney had attended, Mr. Addington had made a phone call up to this gun shop in Sacramento attempting to order a barrel for the type of weapon that Mr. Gwaltney carried that was now missing the barrel. Now confronted by the FBI with this evidence, Addington admitted that Gwaltney had been in his store trying to buy a barrel for his revolver the day after Robin Bishop's murder. Addington had previously lied to state investigators in an effort to avoid getting involved. Fearing that lying to the FBI was a felony, Addington broke down. Appreciate Reviewing the timeline of events, the FBI found that Gwaltney had created a false alibi to cover his visit to the gun shop and shoe repair shop where he'd had his holster cleaned and dyed, claiming to be on duty at the time. Gwaltney's story was falling apart. But the most important part of the timeline that the FBI reviewed was the pickup and delivery of the neighborhood boy, Preston Olson. The problem with that story was nobody had ever sat down with Preston Olson. He testified at two trials, and he verified what Gwaltney said. But as the FBI went over the events with Preston and his mother, minute by minute, they realized that Officer Gwaltney had actually left the boy's house a half hour earlier than his original testimony. Preston never owned a watch and had never timed it, and nobody had ever done a, a timeline analysis with him. This new information and the resulting revision of the timeline was one of the most important developments in the FBI's well, case. We didn't stop for anything. There was no traffic whatsoever. He can't change his story. He's locked himself in on two local trials to the local timeline. So the, the timeline was very significant. It gives him a half hour he has no explanation for. With a revised timeline, Officer Gwaltney now had ample time, 20 to 40 minutes, 
to stop Bishop, handcuff her, force her to have sex with him, then shoot her. Waltney knows she's got out-of-state plates. She's an attractive young blonde woman. He zips up the road, takes him a couple minutes, and then gives chase. Finally, Dr. Edward Blake of Forensic Science Associates was contacted to re-examine the semen evidence from the first two trials. Prior to the use of DNA in criminal trials, the use of semen as evidence was problematic. But the FBI felt there might still be a way to use what they had. Gwaltney had had a vasectomy and had it reversed. Was there any way this information could be used in the identification and matching of his semen with the crime scene specimens? Federal prosecutors asked Dr. Blake, a forensic serologist, if there were any new scientific developments that might help the investigation. He said, well, I mean, science does progress over time, does it not, Dr. Blake? I mean, maybe there's something, and would you be willing to just look into the matter? And I said, well, I happen to know some people that are involved in fertility work, and one of the elements that's involved in this case is uh, the idea that uh, Mr. Gwaltney had had a vasectomy and had it reversed. Dr. Blake learned from colleagues at the University of California that a vasectomy reversal can sometimes cause the production of anti-sperm antibodies. The body reacts to sperm seeping into the bloodstream as if it were invading germs. The phenomenon is highly unusual and could conceivably be used as a marker in seminal fluid. He sent samples from Gwaltney to the University of California lab. We found that not only do those fluids contain the anti-sperm antibodies, the antibodies were there at very, very high levels. And that provided the incentive to then uh, explore uh, the evidence itself. Dr. Blake learned of a new test used in fertility studies. It was called the immunobead assay test and could determine the presence of anti-sperm antibodies in the crime scene samples. Because this kind of evidence had never been used in court before, Dr. Blake videotaped the test to show the jury in the federal trial. Ultimately, uh, extracts that were prepared from uh, a pair of uh, genes uh, that were on Robin Bishop's body, uh, samples that were taken from the uh, highway patrol car seat uh, were prepared, and these samples were tested for the presence of these anti-sperm antibodies and in both of those samples, the antisperm antibodies uh, were found. During the six-month FBI investigation, all of the re-examined evidence and all of the new witness testimony led to one bedrock certainty for the special agents working on the case. We know we've got the right guy, and we're gonna get him. George Gwaltney was going back to court. George Michael Gwaltney was indicted by a federal grand jury for violating the civil rights of Robin Bishop and arrested. He was the first California law officer to be charged under the federal civil rights statute. Once again, he pleaded not guilty. But for the first time since the ordeal began, Robin Bishop's parents had hopes for a different outcome. This time, George Gwaltney faced a federal court and the FBI. It was clear from the beginning that the federal trial would not be a repeat of the first two trials. The federal trial began on January 17, 1984, in the U.S. District Court in Los Angeles. George Gwaltney was represented by public defender Carol Douglas, who chose not to have his client testify. He knew George Gwaltney was in serious trouble. And then he subsequently murdered her. Gwaltney knew that we were breaking his alibis, breaking his stories, and that he was going to have to concoct a new story. He had painted himself into a corner, and we were going to use his brush to paint him into a jail cell. This is a frame of As the trial progressed, guilty, the FBI no punched a hole in every strong point of Gwaltney's earlier defense. The prosecution told the jury that Gwaltney had marked Robin Bishop as prey the first time he saw her in the fast food restaurant. With the testimony of the other women he had abused, 
Waltney's Officer of the Year image crumbled. After dropping Preston Olsen at home, he pulled Bishop over and ordered her into his patrol car. The new testimony now gave him plenty of time. Following an established pattern, he drove to a familiar secluded spot and forced her into a sexual bargain, corroborated by the semen stain on the back seat of his new patrol car. As she sat struggling to put her boots back on, the blinding spotlight of Deputy Kaufman's patrol car hit Waltney, placing Waltney on the access road with Robin Bishop away from her car. Having no idea of who had seen him or what they had seen, he panicked and killed Robin Bishop. Then he breathlessly called the dispatcher with a possible suicide. The autopsy and the crime scene photos showed that he had not moved her head to check for a pulse. The movement was too great. He was desperately searching for the bullet that killed her, one in a series of actions in which he tried to cover up his crime. That night, Waltney roughly removed the barrel from the murder weapon, which left the microscopic tool-marked fingerprints that matched the gun frame with Waltney's tools. But perhaps most damning in the courtroom was the controversial immunobead assay test. Videotape of tested samples from Robin's genes and the car seat show the tiny beads attaching themselves to the sperm. What you can see in these videotapes for the appropriate specimens, that is specimens that contain the anti-sperm antibody, is the final stage of the analysis. Live sperm were shown swimming through the medium with the beads attached, indicating that the antibodies were present in both specimens. Dr. Blake was allowed by the judge only to indicate percentage results of his testing. He testified that Gwaltney's blood type put him in 12% of the population. Of that 12%, only 5% of those would test positive for the presence of anti-sperm antibodies. Less than 1% of the population could possibly have had sexual intercourse with Robin Bishop that night. As much as the defense might argue that the rest of the evidence was circumstantial, the scientific evidence was overpowering. The verdict was returned swiftly. When the jury walked in, um, they would not look at Gwaltney. And it was very clear that they had a guilty verdict. As far as I was concerned, I was pleased and that George had to suffer the consequences of his action and that Robin Bishop's death didn't go uninvestigated. It was, uh, it, it's a case you'll never forget. You took advantage of a vulnerable person. The judge gave George Gwaltney the, the stiffest possible sentence, a maximum federal prison up. term of 90 years, and a minimum Before term of 30 years before becoming eligible for parole. Mr. Gwaltney, you have Twelve years later, your George Gwaltney died in prison of a heart attack. To the end, he claimed he was innocent and had been the victim of a frame-up. Southern Ohio's rural counties are perfect for outdoor recreation. But the calm of this quiet community was shattered in 1989 when a sniper gunned down an outdoorsman without reason. It was only the first in a string of random, terrifying murders. Hiding in the distance behind a high-powered rifle, a madman was hunting humans along Ohio's county roads. Starting in the spring of 1989, a madman prowled the woods and fields of rural Ohio. He was a hunter. A high-powered rifle was his weapon of choice. Joggers and fishermen were his quarry. The hunter roamed far, struck at random, and left no clues. He was as elusive as he was lethal. Investigators knew he had to be stopped, but no one knew how. 
I'm Jim Kallstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. Most murderers have a connection to their victims and a motive for their crime, but not a serial killer. His victims are randomly chosen to fulfill an uncontrollable need to kill. Often he leads an ordinary life, his family and friends unaware of his homicidal passions. But serial killers establish profiles as distinct as fingerprints, and when a match is made, it is only a matter of time before they are caught. The rural counties of southern Ohio are hilly, rocky, and wide open. A quiet place for coal miners, factory workers, and farmers. The kind of place where people leave doors unlocked and where violent crime is almost unheard of. On April 1st, 1989, 35-year-old Donald Welling did what he frequently did on Saturdays. He went jogging along the back roads of Tuscarawas County. His quiet morning run ended with a single shot. The rifle bullet ripped through Welling's heart, killing him instantly. Local authorities could find no motive and not a shred of evidence. The rifle was never found. November 10th, 1990, another Saturday morning, 19 months later. 21-year-old Jamie Paxton of Bannock, Ohio, rose early to go bow hunting. Leaving his crossbow in the car, he took a walk through the tall grass off State Route 9. Paxton was alone and unarmed. He didn't notice the red pickup truck that stopped a short distance away. The gunman was quiet and careful. Jamie Paxton was shot three times by a high-powered rifle. There were no witnesses. The killing horrified a quiet community that considered murder to be a problem for big cities. Hunting accidents are not uncommon in Southern Ohio, but Belmont County Sheriff Tom McCourt knew right away that this wasn't a hunting accident. When we saw more than one wound, we knew that it could not be an accident, that uh, an accidental death hunting accident is called a one shot. Plus, we saw it was a bullet wound instead of, of something from an arrow, and the gun season was not in yet. Sheriff Tom McCourt's jurisdiction is large geographically, but the community is closely knit. There, people work hard, and everyone seems to know everyone. McCourt even knew Jamie Paxton. What he didn't know was who killed him. The gunman had left no clues. We checked the area for spent, empty cartridge cases, for tire tracks, for anything uh, in that area of where we thought the shot came from. We also uh, checked the area around the body looking for the spent projectiles that had passed through the body. We even took metal detectors in looking for the, uh, the projectiles. Uh, at that time, we were unable to find anything. You know, run over there to by the marina and uh, see After what, interviewing Jamie what, Paxton's uh, friends, family, and acquaintances, uh, they were unable to find anyone with a motive to kill him. Everyone in the area knew Jamie Paxton. No one that we knew of or was able, even to this day, have ever found anyone who disliked a young man. Or she. Sheriff McCourt had an apparently random killing of a popular young man with no history of trouble. They interviewed Fred and everything. A seemingly unsolvable murder with no physical evidence and no witnesses. 
Not even a plausible theory about what happened. Um, I think that's about it. After her son's death, Jean Paxton's grief impelled her to action. She began composing letters to a local paper, the Martins Ferry Times Leader, designed to draw out the killer. There was just every time I would sit down to write a letter, I would say a prayer. And I would say, please, God, just give me the words to get the, to the person that killed my son. The letters were at once stern and passionate. To the murderer of my son, Jamie, she wrote, would it be easier for you if I wrote words of hate? I can't because I don't feel hate. I feel deep sorrow at losing my son. You took a light from my life last November and left me with many days of darkness. Have you thought of your own death? It'll happen. Unless you confess your sin and ask for God's forgiveness, you will face the fire and fury of hell at your own death. If the killer were reading Gene Paxton's letters, he seemed unaffected by them. On November 28, 1990, just 18 days after Paxton's murder, 30-year-old Kevin Loring was on a hunting trip in Muskegon County, Ohio, some 40 miles from where Jamie Paxton was killed. While his friends finished eating lunch, Kevin decided to get a head start. Walking across a field in search of game, Loring himself became prey, unknowingly moving into the sights of the gunman. Loring was killed by a single gunshot wound to the head. The killer had taken care to commit his murders in different counties to slow an investigation that would have to take place over hundreds of rural miles. The result? Investigators in Muskegon County were unaware of the other sniper victims in nearby counties. They decided that Loring's death was probably a hunting accident. Jean Paxton never gave up. She kept writing throughout 1991, determined to draw out Jamie's killer. And I always felt if I could get my letters into the hands of the person that killed my son, I felt that I could get a response from them. She turned out to be right. I am the murderer of Jamie Paxton, the typewritten letter read, Jamie Paxton was a complete stranger to me. I never saw him before in my life, and he never said a word to me that Saturday. Paxton was killed because of an irresistible compulsion that has taken over my life. I knew when I left my house that day that someone would die by my hand. I just didn't know who or where. I'm an average-looking person with a family, a job, and home, just like yourself. Something in my head causes me to turn into a merciless killer with no conscience. The letter arrived at the Martins Ferry Times leader a few days before the one year anniversary of Jamie's death. The letter described the Paxton murder in chilling detail. I was very drunk and a voice in my head said, do it. I stopped my car behind Jamie's and got out. Jamie started walking very slowly down the hill toward the road. I raised my rifle to my shoulder and lined him up in the sights. I took at least five seconds to take careful aim. My first shot was off a little bit and hit him in the right chest. He groaned and went down. I 
wanted to make sure he was finished, so I fired a second shot aimed halfway between his hip and shoulder while he was prone on the ground. I jerked the shot and hit him in the knee. He never moved again. Five minutes after I shot Paxton, I was drinking a beer and it blacked out all thoughts of what I had just done out of my mind. I thought no more of shooting Paxton than shooting a bottle at the dump. I know you hate my guts and rightfully so. I think about Jamie every hour of the day, as I'm sure you do. For Sheriff McCourt, the letter was a beginning, evidence that might lead to a murderer. But he needed more, the typewriter used to write the letter, a gun. While investigators searched, the killer continued his own hunting. Saturday, March 14th, 1992. Claude Hawkins got off his midnight shift at the Pittsburgh Blade and Glass Company about sunup. It was a good time to fish, and Hawkins went straight to a favorite spot on the river below Wills Creek Dam. and four children. Another outdoorsman had been killed while alone. But this one took place on federal property. The FBI stepped in. The FBI joined the hunt for the roadside sniper who just killed his latest victim on federal yes, property. Investigators from the three counties involved, along with the FBI and the Ohio Division of Wildlife, formed a task force. It didn't take long to realize how few clues they had. In each case, the killer had no contact with the victim, no rifling of pockets, no robbery. Shell casings had been carefully removed, and the victim's cars were untouched. Special Agent Harry Trombitis was stationed at the FBI's Columbus, Ohio field office. What we did know is that uh, Mr. Hawkins died from a gunshot, and usually you would find some type of a shell casing in the area. And I remember looking very hard, uh, metal detectors and hands and knees for any shell casings in that, and none were ever found. And so that was something that, you know, if in fact we had somebody who was evidence conscious enough to pick up the shell casing after they shot and killed somebody. We were dealing with a different brand of person here. The multi-jurisdictional task force concluded that the death of Kevin Loring, first ruled accidental, was actually a homicide. Gentlemen, we got a problem. Okay, what I got is, um... Reviewing the four murders, the investigative team saw plenty in common. Outdoorsmen, hunters, fishermen, or joggers, alone in a rural setting, all shot with a high-powered rifle. All but one of the murders occurred on a weekend, and the killer was careful enough to leave no evidence. He didn't have any interest in his victims. It was more clear than ever that a single individual was responsible. 
the task force was on the trail of a serial killer. As they began to mobilize, the killer struck again. I know we can capture this person. I know we can. Ten days after the task force meeting on April 5th, 1992, 44-year-old steelworker Gary Brent left his home in neighboring West Virginia to go pond fishing in Noble County. Bradley's wife and three children would never see him alive again. The task force had another murder. The road sniper had to be stopped. The task force wanted to learn more about the personality of the sniper. They asked the FBI to draw up a psychological profile of the serial killer. Such an outline would be invaluable in tracking him down. Major Dane Shryock of the Coshocton County Sheriff's Office headed the task force. Right after uh, we had initially made an assessment that maybe these things might be linked, uh, the Columbus FBI office uh, set up a, a meeting uh, to have uh, the Behavioral Science Unit uh, come to Columbus, Ohio, and actually sit down and talk with the investigators of these five counties of uh, the homicides. The FBI's Behavioral Science Unit in Quantico, Virginia, can accurately sketch personality profiles of individuals from sparse clues. Larry Ankrum is a member of the Behavioral Science Unit assigned to the Road Sniper case. He studied all the available evidence, the investigative reports of the five murders, and especially the letter that the killer had written to Gene Paxton. Then I, I came back to Quantico and reviewed these cases more in detail, and I came out with a formal profile. We were probably looking for a white male. We were looking for someone that was intelligent, someone who was an outdoorsman himself, someone that wouldn't look out of place in the, uh, in the woods, um, someone that was probably uh, uh, responding to some significant event in his life that was going wrong at that particular time. Uh, one of the things that uh, was apparent uh, that it was a sniper type mentality here that we were dealing with, someone that uh, didn't want confrontation someone that was doing things from afar. And this is something uh, that we see many times with our arsonists. We ought to be looking at some different types of activities that he might be involved in, such as nuisance types of offenses, shooting out windows, shooting out tires of cars, cruelty to animals, uh, arson fires. Ankrum believed that the violence was triggered by stress and fueled by alcohol. The task force now had a psychological sketch of the roadside sniper. And they had his letter. FBI forensic scientists studied the letter intensely. They found distinguishing features in the typeface. If they could find the typewriter it was written on, it would be easy to link the confessional letter to the owner and thus link the murder to the murderer. They had to hurry. The sniper was still out there. On July 21st, 1992, two hunters in a state park in Muskegon County came face to face with the killer. As they moved through the brush, one of them noticed something terrifying. A nearby figure with a gun pointed right at them. They called out to him, and the man scurried away to a red pickup truck. 
It happened too quickly for the hunters to get a good look at the man or the vehicle's tag numbers. Bewildered, they called local police who alerted the task force. Throughout 1992, desperate to catch a man still ready to kill, the task force investigated and cleared more than 100 suspects. By August 1992, after three years, the investigation had hit a dead end. The task force was badly in need of information and decided to go public. It is in the opinion of this multi-agency task force that these they held a press conference and issued a press release detailing the FBI profile of the man they wanted and asking anyone with information to come forward. The FBI made a press release and it was done at one time to mass, and it got everybody, six o'clock news, I mean everybody was showing this, this case and the phone started ringing instantly. Wilson. One of those calls received at task force headquarters on August 26, 1992, sparked a lead. The man on the phone was named Richard Fry. He said he thought the task force should know about a high school friend of his named Thomas Dillon. Investigators had a name and someone willing to talk. A task force member arranged to meet Richard Fry at a rest stop on Route 77. Tom Dillon. I went to high school with him. We grew up together. There, Fry talked about his old friend, Tom Dillon. They used to drive around rural Ohio, shooting at road signs and small animals. But Fry eventually found Dylan too eccentric and violent for his taste. Obsessed with serial killers like Ted Bundy, Dylan had taken to killing family pets and cattle and setting random fires. Fry got married and for most of the 1980s forgot about his strange friend. But in 1989, Fry ran into Thomas Dylan at a gun show in Cleveland. Tom? Thomas. Dylan invited him to ride along with him again, just like in the old days. <laughs> old friendships die hard, and Richard Fry again found himself driving the back roads of rural Ohio, drinking beer and shooting road signs. But Dylan had deteriorated, Fry discovered. Dylan asked whether Fry thought Dylan had ever killed anyone. We've known each other for a long time. 20 some years, I guess. Yeah. Do you think I could ever kill anybody? Tom, I, you know, we, like you said, we go way back. I mean. He discussed how to get away with random killings, yeah, including the tactic that. of killing in different like, counties to thwart investigators. Kill them in separate counties, you know. They never connected. And being at random, they'd have. No clues whatsoever. Not average, your average guy. Fry said that when he read the press release, he immediately thought of Tom Dillon. He gave a description of Dillon, including the vehicle he drove, a red pickup truck, just like the one spotted by the hunters. Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. Lieutenant Walt Wilson of the Tuscaroras County Sheriff's Office was a task force member. His job was to follow up on leads and tips, which were coming much more frequently as press coverage of the case increased. He decided Tom Dillon fit the FBI profile and needed to be investigated. I began to follow up on the information that Mr. Fry had given us. I went to Tom Dillon's workplace in the city of Canton Employees. Dylan Mr. had been employed Dillon. for a dozen years as a draftsman at the Canton, Ohio well, Water Works. Just to get, uh, your, your Wilson insight. obtained Thomas you know, Dillon's kind of work schedule years. to compare Dylan's days off with the dates and times of the murders. The purpose was to eliminate Dylan as a suspect, but he couldn't. He found that Dylan please? didn't work weekends uh, when most of the incidents occurred. Thing. But Would that didn't prove much. However, two weekdays Dillon, Dillon took off from work caught Wilson's attention. 
July 21, 1992, the day the hunters saw a man point a rifle at them, and November 28, 1990, the day Kevin Loring was killed. Dylan could be the one. As the other members of the task force followed up on hundreds of leads, Detective Wilson began surveillance on Thomas Dillon. Maybe Dillon would return to a crime scene or lead investigators to more clues. The surveillance began in October 1992. Detective Wilson followed Tom Dillon on his weekend excursions, driving the back roads of Southern Ohio. Typically, a day would start around 7 in the morning on Tom's days off, the weekends usually. And he would leave his home, and he would sometimes he would stop at a uh, convenience store and buy some beer, and then he would go south of his home into other counties, uh, just driving all the back remote roadways. On October 10, 1992, while tailing Dillon, Wilson briefly lost track of the suspect's vehicle. As Wilson crept around a corner, he came face to face with Thomas Dillon. His cover possibly blown, his case in jeopardy, Wilson had to think fast. I waved at him and he waved at me and we kept on going. He stopped at the end of the drive to see if I was going to stay there or not. Wilson couldn't risk being identified. He let Dylan drive away. My big concern was I hope he doesn't stop and ask me what I'm doing on that property because I had all of my gear laying in the car with me and I didn't want him to see my radios and, and my gear that I had with me. A few days later, Larry Oler of Barnhill, Ohio, was hunting about 150 yards off a road in Tuscarawas County. He heard a car stop. Through the trees, he saw a stocky white male. The man lifted a rifle. Oler was unhurt and watched in terror as the truck sped away. Although Oler's description of his assailant resembled Dylan, he was unable to make a positive identification. The task force realized that Thomas Dylan was their most likely suspect. Surveillance of him would have to be beefed up. Throughout October and November of 1992, the FBI coordinated a massive air and ground surveillance. Dylan was observed shooting road signs and busting car windows with rocks exactly the sort of petty vandalism outlined in the FBI profile. But if they arrested Dillon for vandalism, they might never gather enough evidence to arrest him for the murders. It is difficult to tail someone on an empty rural road in broad daylight. The stakes were high. If Dillon tried another shooting and the FBI weren't in the right spot, they could have another murder. If they crowded Dillon too much, they might be found out. Dylan would slip into hiding. The ground surveillance had to be well off of Dylan. Agent Trombitis and Captain Shryock relied on the air surveillance as their eyes and ears. They would move in if something happened. One day, the surveillance team faced its worst fear. Trombitis and Shryock were far behind Dylan when the air surveillance called out an alert. Up ahead of Dylan on the road was the classic profile of a road sniper victim, a jogger, female this time, alone in a rural setting. If Thomas Dylan were indeed the gunman, this jogger may be irresistible bait. Trombitis and Triot got nervous. Hoping for the best, they sped forward. Dylan continued too, right toward the jogger. Driving at top speed, Trombitis and Shryock frantically called to the agents in the plane. Where is he? Is he stopping? The airplane reported back. 
Dylan is approaching her. There is no one nearby. The agent's car hurtled forward. A call from the air. Dylan is pulling up alongside the jogger. The agents held their breath. He passed her without incident. The feeling of relief lasted only moments. The airplane radioed that Dylan had taken a right turn onto a smaller road. Right, right. The aerial unit stayed on him, instructing Trombitis and Shryock where yeah, to turn. Right. Still on, right. Then a second right turn. Could he be circling back? Right. You see him. Negative. Do not see. They called to the airplane. Is the jogger still there? Go, go. Dylan continued to make right turns until he was back on the road the jogger had been on. His U-turn justified the agent's fear. He was going back for him. Where is the jogger? Trimbitis yelled into his radio. Cannot see the jogger, came the reply. But the agents knew she had to be somewhere ahead of Dylan. If he came upon her again, they were sure he would kill her. The air unit called in that Dylan had stopped his truck and had gotten out. He had something shiny in his hands. Would he kill her right under their noses? The jogger couldn't be seen from the air, but that didn't mean she wasn't there. The agents in the car heard shots and feared that Dylan had struck again while under their surveillance. But the airplane radioed that Dylan was shooting a stop sign. The jogger had turned off the road. She was safe, unaware of her close encounter with Thomas Dillon. I think so. The cat and mouse yeah, game with Thomas we'll Dillon began to wear on the task force yeah, members. I figure if we have five ground here. A lot of pressure. I mean, you're wondering whether uh, this guy today is going to go out and kill somebody and you aren't going to be able to stop it. And you know that, that he's probably the one that, that is responsible for killing other people. Um, you're, you're working 14, 16 hours a day, you're living out of a car, uh, you're drinking coffee like policemen, you know, and you aren't eating right, and the stress is just is tremendous. But the net continued to tighten around the suspect. The murderer, in his letter to the newspaper, had admitted being bothered by the Paxton murder and visiting his grave. Investigators returned to video footage of Jamie Paxton's grave recorded November 10th, 1991, the first anniversary of Jamie's murder. Many people paid their respects that day, but curiosity rather than respect was the agenda of one visitor photographed, Thomas Dillon. Investigators immediately recognized the man they had been tailing. Surely he was the sniper, but to earn a conviction, they needed direct incriminating evidence. After the second anniversary of Jamie Paxton's death in 1992, surveillance observed Dylan entering the Times Leader building. He bought a copy of the previous day's paper full of the details of the Paxton Memorial Service. The FBI had good circumstantial evidence on Thomas Dylan, but they still lacked physical evidence, a bullet, a gun, or a typewriter to link him with just one of the victims. Hunting season was fast approaching. Dylan was still out roaming the rural roads, drunk, armed, deadly. The communities of Southern Ohio had been terrorized for three years. The people feared going outside, but tried to live normal lives. Dylan had to be taken off the streets. The task force knew Dylan had been in trouble in the past for illegally owning a silencer and was forbidden to possess firearms a stipulation he clearly violated during his vandalism sprees. The task force had little choice. Before he could kill again, they would arrest Thomas Dillon. But the plan wasn't just to arrest him on a weapons violation. 
but to convince him he was caught red-handed and get him to confess to murder. Lacking ballistic evidence and holding only a relatively minor weapons charge on Dillon, the FBI badly needed to elicit a confession. Trombitis had a plan. Since we knew what his routine was through the surveillances and that, where he left his residence and he would go to this dairy mart every day before he left and went on his three, four hundred mile drives, um, we would try to uh, make the approach at the dairy mart and what we had was an office building right across from the dairy mart um, where we occupied, we took over the basement of that building. Detective Wilson and I did was we went down into the basement uh, where we were going to conduct the interview and we put up along the walls of the, uh, the whole room maps of the areas that he drove in, crime scene photographs, um, in newspaper articles. We wanted to make that setting just irresistible to him. Then we're just going to piece by piece start laying this out in front of him and see what kind of reaction we get from him. We got back up it would be overwhelming and, and you know, it would put him in the best frame of mind for us to be able to sit down and interview okay, Harry, him and get a confession. Mr. Dillon. On November 27, 1992, the plan went into effect. Their entire case so far rested on getting a confession. The idea was for when he came out of the dairy mart, we were going to approach him, identify ourselves, and uh, basically request that, that he follow us voluntarily over to this room where we wanted to share some information with him and uh, show him some things that we knew that would interest him. If Dylan refused, Trombitis would raise his right hand to signal ATF agents who are responsible for making arrests in weapons cases to cuff Dylan. And I can just remember his reaction, I mean, his jaw just uh, for about five seconds. And then he composed himself and he said, I want to talk to my attorney first. That was the cue. Trombitis gave the signal and the ATF agents stepped in and arrested Thomas Dillon. Dillon didn't realize it, but it was a bitter defeat for the FBI. Trombitis thought he'd blown it, despite all the evidence he'd gathered, despite his certainty that they had the road sniper. He feared that he would see a five-time murderer quickly released on a minor weapons charge. At the very time of Dillon's arrest, other task force members were executing a search warrant on Dillon's house. Finally, the FBI felt they would come away with the physical evidence desperately needed to link him, once and for all, to the murders. But they didn't. To their surprise, the search turned up nothing more incriminating than some area maps marked with arson and vandalism sites. Dylan was refusing to talk. They were holding him, but there was nothing they could do with him. It was pretty much over when he said he wanted to talk to his attorney. So we went back to the restaurant uh, and we we're going to have a cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, we got the word that uh, he wanted to talk to us. And uh, so Walt and I um, jumped into our car and we made a beeline to Stark County Jail. Trombitis and Wilson confronted Dillon with one piece of evidence after another. Photographs, videotapes, newspaper clippings showing his link to the murders. I would pull out one piece at a time and show him and just as we had suspected. Uh, he just was keenly interested in the information that we had, the surveillance pictures, the crime scene photos, um, you know, just the animal, you know, the, the shots of the animals that we had along the roadways and that. He was, you could just see that he was just fascinated by that. Fascinated but not talkative, Dylan said it would serve no purpose to admit anything now. Another dead end for the FBI. Dylan's attorney is arguing that he should be spared jail time on the weapons charge. Now, unless something turned up on him very quickly, Thomas Dillon would have to be released. Thank the various representatives of the media for showing up today. The task force was now fighting the clock. Desperate for physical evidence, they held another press conference, appealing to the public for any information about guns they may have bought or sold with Thomas Dillon. Have had any contact with Mr. Dillon? 
Meanwhile, Task Force member Jerry Wade of the Ohio Division of Wildlife was following up on a tip. A witness steered Wade to a spot where he had seen Thomas Dillon firing his rifle a couple of years back. Wade hoped that would lead him to some ballistic evidence to link Dillon to one of the killings. This individual uh, that brought us to our attention that he'd seen Thomas uh, Lee Dillon shoot this deer with a rifle thought the rifle might be one of them that was used. And if we could locate um, some physical evidence, uh, the shell casings per se, and if we could get those and match them to the murder weapon, we could uh, put that rifle in Thomas Lee Dillon's hand prior to the murders, which would really uh, give us a lot stronger case as far as him possessing the rifle uh, prior to the murders. The chances of finding the small shells in such a wide area were slim, and it had been two years since the rifle had been fired there. Determined, Wade patiently combed inch by inch through a grassy field where the anonymous witness said he saw Dylan shoot the deer. Beginning at the tree described by the witness, Wade searched the area in a circular pattern by hand and with a metal detector, carefully marking off the territory. Miraculously, Wade hit the jackpot. He found two rifle shell casings, later identified as coming from the same gun that killed Gary Bradley and Claude Hawkins. Finally, a physical link to the murders. I felt like celebrating. Uh, it was just unbelievable that I found them because after the time, the the length of time that uh, had been since the shooting and the incident and the individual wasn't sure the location of the tree exactly. Uh, the scene had changed since he had been there. They had done a, removed a fence row and, and pushed out the area. So I felt very, very much fortunate to find him and I felt like a celebration at the time. It was just like, you know, it was a gift handed to you. Meanwhile, the publicity from the press conference asking the public for help was about to bear fruit. On December 4th, Captain Shryock was manning the phones at Task Force headquarters. A man named Al Cope was on the phone. He said he bought a weapon from someone who may have been Thomas Dillon at a gun show the previous spring. I'll tell you what, if you give me, uh, give me about 15 minutes, sir, I'll be right there. The date? April 5th, the same day Gary okay. Bradley was murdered. The rifle was sent to the FBI laboratory in Washington for ballistics testing. Special Agent Paul Schrecker is a ballistics expert for the FBI. As the bullet passes down the barrel of the weapon, that bullet by coming in direct contact with the interior of the barrel of the weapon, picks up the microscopic imperfections, the microscopic features of that barrel. So that bullet is marked with the fingerprint of that barrel. Fragments of bullets taken from the bodies of victims Claude Hawkins and Gary Bradley were examined at FBI labs. A bullet fragment may still be a value for comparison. Even though a bullet may fragment, may break up as a result of striking a victim, and maybe only fragments are ever recovered, those fragments are still marked. They still bear the impressions of the inside of the barrel of the weapon. And those fragments can still be used to make a positive association or an identification. When the weapon was submitted to our laboratory, the weapon was test fired, and the test fired bullets from this weapon were then compared to the bullet fragments taken from the victims. Al Cope's gun was test fired and the bullets examined for characteristics they may have in common with the bullet fragments taken from Gary Bradley and Claude Hawkins. The conclusion, Al Cope's gun sold to him by Thomas Dillon matched the gun used to kill both Gary Bradley and Claude Hawkins. The FBI finally had the goods on Thomas Dillon.
Agent Trombitis visited Dylan in jail and confronted him with the evidence. He and his truck fit the descriptions of a few witnesses. He had been off work when each murder had occurred. He had a history of random violence and gunplay. And the FBI could prove in court that a gun he once owned killed at least two of the victims. What kind of proof? What kind of proof? All the proof we need. But Trombitis knew Dylan was guilty of all five murders, and he wanted closure for the victims' families. He offered Dylan a deal. As leverage, Trombitis reminded Dylan that he faced Ohio's electric chair. Dylan got nervous, and he began to negotiate. And what's your assessment of the situation? I still can't believe you got that hard evidence. Thomas Dillon met with the prosecutors in June of 1993. He agreed to admit to five killings if the death penalty were dropped as a possible sentence. Five terms, one each for each of the acts committed. On July 9th, Dillon confessed to prosecutors in order to save his life. On July 12, 1993, a smirking Thomas Dillon walked into the Noble County Courthouse to make his plea. Mr. Dillon, at this time, how do you plead uh, to count one in the indictment in case number 93, CR4, uh, involving the death of uh, the aggravated murder charge involving the death of Gary Bradley? How do you plead? Guilty. With the families of the victims watching, two, Dillon confessed uh, that, to murdering uh, Donald Welling, Kevin Loring, death, uh, Claude Hawkins, Claude, Gary Bradley, and Jamie Count Paxton. Two, uh, in that, uh, case of that uh, the death of he was still smirking and unrepentant as he left Count court. Two, at this time of the indictment in case number 93, CR4. Guilty. Hello? Tom. This is Thomas. Yeah. Dylan's incredibly cavalier attitude was detailed by a local reporter whom Dylan repeatedly called from prison, marveling at his own violence, reveling in his celebrity, and laughing off the murders. Let's talk about the other guys. I mean, they. Except one. Really good shit. He would not discuss the murder of Jamie Paxton. Forget it. All right. Just forget it. Jean Paxton, Jamie's mother, was in court the day Dylan pleaded guilty. I just want to talk to him about Jamie, the kind of person Jamie was. Jamie was everything Thomas Dylan could never be. He is, uh, Dylan is a coward, he hid behind a gun, and Jamie was, Jamie was not that way. Little did I know that on the evening news he was watching that, and it made him very angry that I had called him a pathetic coward. We talked to him about remorse and how did you feel after these homicides, and the, and the only one that he said that it really bothered him about was uh, Jamie Paxton. He said, I didn't realize the kid was so young. Jean Paxton had looked forward to confronting Dylan in court, but his guilty plea cost her that opportunity. She asked Sheriff McCourt to arrange a conversation. Hi. McCourt agreed. That evening, Jean Paxton's phone in. rang. She found herself speaking with the murderer of her son. Uh, when I picked up the phone that evening, it was just like somebody calling up to sell me something. He said, Mrs. Paxton, this is Tom Dillon. It was just almost more than I could comprehend the tone of his voice, the way he came across. Still, the arrogance was there. You really hurt my feelings this afternoon when... Dylan told Jean coward. Paxton that when she called him a coward, she had hurt his feelings. Uh-huh. I really don't think he expected to get what he got from me. I think that Thomas Dylan could have handled the crying, the screaming, the saying of calling names, the, the cursing. I think he could handle that, but I did not lower myself to that level. I talked to him as a mother, and I really feel that through this whole thing, that is what got to Thomas Dillon. Well, I, I understand. After three years, Jean Paxton felt vindicated. Mm -hmm. I felt really good. I walked out on my front porch, and I just felt like for the first time in 
three years that I was free. I was free of Thomas Dillon. I felt that I had defeated him by words, and I did it all for Jamie. Thomas Dillon made it clear he did not want to go to Lucasville Prison, the toughest in Ohio. So Gene Paxton saw to it, with a petition drive, that that was exactly where Dillon was sent. In August 1993, Gene Paxton won a $25 million wrongful death judgment against any future money Dillon might make. Dillon's wife had been trying to sell his story to Hollywood. Paxton and State Senator Bob Nye passed the Paxton Bill, barring killers or their relatives from profiting from the crime. Thomas Dillon remains in Lucasville Prison. He is eligible for parole in 165 years.